notes. Turn with me to Acts chapter 24. Let me go ahead and pray for us. Father, we love you. We love you. We love you. And we need you. And God, we are asking that you would please, as you have already met with us in such a special way during the time of praise and worship, that you would continue on, God, by your grace, you would pour your spirit out. I pray, O oh God, that you would open the eyes of our hearts, that you would open our minds, Lord, that you would stir us, God, by your word, that you would bring your word to life and that it would cut, Lord, deep to the inner, inner man, inner woman, and that we would all be blessed, God, by spending time with you and by meeting with you in your word. And I pray that you would teach us by your spirit. And I pray that you would be glorified above all. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Acts chapter 24. Well, the context here is still very much the same as it has been in the last few chapters of Acts. And Paul uh, completed his third missionary journey and then he went to Jerusalem. He had been warned sharply not to go, for he would indeed be bound, but he was going to go and nothing was going to stop him because he was certain that was God's will for him. And he did go, and uh, true enough, he was bound there in the temple. And the Jews started an uprising there, and they, they, they wanted to tear Paul apart. And so Claudius Lysias... Um, the, the commander that was stationed there at the temple precinct came in with his troops and rescued Paul and couldn't really figure out what was going on. So the next day he tried to come back and, and reconvene and it went bad all over again. And so he had to rescue Paul a second time. And so now Paul has been taken to Caesarea and we're going to see his third public hearing. There are six of them. I think from chapter 21, 22 on to chapter 28, there are six public defenses that Paul gives for himself, and today we're going to be looking at the third. So as we've already talked about the idea that God had called Paul to be a chosen vessel, you remember that? We talked about being a, a chosen vessel for God, that he has a purpose for us as believers. We used to be vessels of, of dishonor. Remember I talked about the, the bucket of slop, the, the pig slop bucket, you know, and that's not something that you would feed your guest out of. That's a vessel of dishonor. And such, that, that was many of us in this room, we, that was the kind of vessel that we were. But thanks be to God that by His grace and mercy, He made us alive in Christ Jesus and has now made us a vessel of honor for, for His glory. And He uses us to that end. And such was the case for Paul. Nevertheless, Paul struggled. He had all kinds of hardships and difficulties and calamities. But Paul was faithful. He continued to serve the Lord even in imprisonment, even as he was taken from place to place and mob after mob and jail after jail. He was still faithful. He was indeed a prisoner of the Lord. And that's what I titled today's message. Paul saw himself as such, and he talked about that in Philippians. He saw himself as a prisoner of the Lord, certainly not a prisoner of Rome. He was not bound by Rome. Rome was bound to Paul, quite frankly. They could not escape him. Because God had called Paul to that place to do a mighty work. And I couldn't help but think about Joseph again in the Old Testament. Pastor Bill was teaching on this Wednesday night. Uh, God did some wonderful things in Joseph's life, but he had many years of difficulty. He rose to a tremendous place of prominence in Egypt, second in command, but not without much adversity, not without going through many years of imprisonment even. But ultimately, God worked that out for good. But you know, when Joseph was going through all of that, he was still very faithful. He still saw himself as a servant of the Lord. And wherever he was at, he served God. And God blessed wherever Joseph was at. God blessed the work of his hands. And people knew it. They knew that this household or even the jail was blessed because of Joseph's presence. He was a prisoner of the Lord. And so we're still very much in that context. That's what we're looking at here. Paul is still on defense. He's still on trial for the gospel. He is a prisoner of the Lord here in Rome. And Jesus met with him, you'll recall, and said, just as you were a witness to me in Jerusalem, now you will be a witness to me in Rome. And so we're seeing that happen. And this was all part of the fulfillment of Paul's ministry in the first place. You'll recall back in Acts chapter 9, 
When Jesus sent Ananias to Paul, he said, Saul at that time, I must show him the things that he will suffer. And his ministry indeed was marked by suffering. But honestly, this goes back even farther. It goes back to Matthew chapter 10, if I'm not mistaken. When Jesus told the disciples that they would be dragged into the synagogues, they would be beaten, they would be persecuted, they would be put on the spot. He said, but don't worry about what you're going to say, for in that hour, the, the Holy Spirit will tell you what to say. You will know what to say. And so we're seeing this play out with the Apostle Paul here and now. And that's the, the context of our story. So today we pick up in Acts chapter 24, verse 1. Paul has gone from Jerusalem to Caesarea. Here we go. Now after five days, Ananias the high priest came down with the elders and a certain orator named Tertullus. These gave evidence to the governor against Paul. And when he was called upon, Tertullus began his accusation, saying, Seeing that through you we enjoy great peace and prosperity as being brought to this nation by your foresight, we accept it always and in all places, most noble Felix, with all thankfulness. Nevertheless, not to be tedious to you any further, I beg you to hear by your courtesy a few words from us. So we're told this is five days later. This is five days from the point when Paul was taken back before the Sanhedrin. And you'll recall he starts out by saying, Gentlemen, I've been in good conscience before God to this day. And then Ananias, um, excuse me, Ananias, the high priest, Ananias, yeah, had him struck on the, on the mouth. You remember, you remember that? Okay, so it's five days from that point. Here we are. And now the Jews have come from Jerusalem, and they came with a skilled orator. So this is a lawyer. Oftentimes you hear the word lawyer in the Gospels, and this would be someone who is a, a copier of the Old Testament Scriptures, a scribe. But this guy is actually a professional orator. He's a public speaker, and he is a skilled prosecutor. They came with their A game, and they are doing their best to take Paul out. And so he opens up with this, uh, it's really an obligatory kind of flattery that he's giving to Felix, you know, and he lays it on thick. Did you notice that? Now, the reality is he was lying through his teeth. The Jews hated Felix. Felix was a terrible guy. He's an interesting character. Uh, he was born a slave. He and his brother, Paulus, were slaves, and they were actually childhood friends with Claudius, uh, Caesar Claudius, and so because of that, as, as um, they grew uh, in age, they were set free, Paulus and Felix, and they had great favor with, with uh, Emperor Claudius, and uh, they rose to prominence in Rome, and Felix was actually given the, the place of governor over Judea. Tacitus, the Roman historian, said that he ruled with the power of royalty but had the spirit of a slave and he was very brutal and he was known for it and there are all kinds of stories about the, the horrors that happened under Felix's reign and the Jews did not like him one bit at all so he's clearly lying here he's he's doing his best to to flatter Felix and so now he's going to get to the brass tacks here. He's going to lay out the accusations that, that they have against Paul here. And this is verses 5 through 9. For we have found this man a plague, a creator of dissension among all the Jews throughout the world, a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple, and we seized him and wanted to judge him according to our law. But the commander, Lysias, came by and with great violence took him out of, the, out of our hands, commanding his accusers to come to you. By examining him yourself, you may ascertain all these things of which we accuse him. And the Jews also assented, maintaining that these things were so. So there are really three things that Tertullus tries to throw at Paul here. You know, Tertullus, my, my autocorrect kept wanting to call him tortillas. And so I like that because he's kind of a pest, pest, you know, so I thought we'll just call him tortillas. Uh, but he says that Paul is a plague. He's a creator of dissension. Two, he says Paul is a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. That, that one little line right there is basically three things happening there, all negative. He's a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. And then thirdly, he says he tried to profane the temple. He tried to desecrate the temple. So those are the three charges that Tertullus is bringing here. 
And really, the first two aren't even charges at all, necessarily. Uh, to say that the guy is a nuisance or he's a pain is not really a charge. But what he's appealing to here is he's talking about sedition. This guy is stirring up trouble. And that was one of the biggest things that Rome tried to, to, to keep to a minimum was uprisings and troublemakers and, and things like that. And so they're, they're kind of appealing to that. This guy's a real troublemaker. He's always trying to stir up riots, and we all know that you guys take that very seriously, so we just want you to know he's one of those guys. He's a troublemaker. He's a plague. He's a, he's a pestilent individual. And secondly, he said he's a, a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. The word ringleader, we hear that, and we know that's bad, generally. When we hear that, it automatically conjures up negative ideas. Well, such was the case in the Greek language there. It was a very negative thing. And to say that he was a, a sect is to say that he's basically an unauthorized leader or a leader of an unauthorized religion in Rome. Now, Rome, they, they certainly had many, many gods and they allowed many different people to worship different gods, but they had to be authorized by Rome. And the, the Jews were authorized to worship Yahweh, but he's kind of trying to separate, distance the Jews from the Christians here and say this is some sort of an unauthorized sect over which he is a ringleader and Nazareth, kind of, people had disdain for Naz Nazareth anyway. So to, to say that he was a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes would automatically kind of bring up a little bit of disgust with, with the people there. So we see what he's trying to do here. Now he finally gets to the third charge, which would actually be more legitimate. That is, he tried to desecrate the temple. Now you'll recall a few chapters back, Paul was in the temple, and there were some Jews there from Asia, and they saw Trophimus. Trophimus was from Ephesus, and they recognized him there in Jerusalem. So they assumed that Paul had brought this Gentile into the temple, which was punishable by death. Now, the, the Jews had had their rights of capital punishment taken away from them by Rome. They weren't allowed to kill people without, uh, without permission by Rome, which is why they had to take Jesus before um, Pontius Pilate. But in this one case, they made an exception. If a Gentile went into the temple beyond the court of the Gentiles, they could kill him on the spot. So that's what they were trying to accuse Paul of doing here, but it simply wasn't true. It did not happen, and they really didn't have any evidence to back up what they were saying anyways. And then Tertullus blames the commander for getting involved. He said, we had this under control and then your guy came in and drug Roman to this whole thing, and that was totally unnecessary. And then the rest of the Jews chime in at this point, and they, they basically say, yeah, all this is true. So now Paul is going to step forward, and he's going to defend himself. And he's going to speak to all three of these charges. So verse 10, he's going to start by addressing the fact that he is not a troublemaker, as they have accused. Verse 10, then Paul after the governor had nodded to him to speak, answered, And as much as I know that you have been for many years a judge of this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself, because you may ascertain that it is no more than twelve days since I went up to Jerusalem to worship. And they neither found me in the temple disrupting with, uh, or disputing with anyone or inciting the crowd, either in the synagogues or in the city, nor can they prove the things of which they now accuse me. So Paul is respectful here, but he does not give flattery. He's basically like, you've been a governor, you've been a judge for a long time. I can give you that. And, uh, you know, that's, the reality is, is that he had been, and he had handled many cases, and he was very familiar with the issues surrounding the nation. So Paul was grateful for that. He knew that he was going to be able to get a more accurate and fair hearing with this guy. He wasn't just going to buy into the line from the Jews here. He was going to have a certain amount of knowledge and expertise into what's actually being said. So... Um, Paul points out that this all happened very recently, just 12 days earlier, and that everything that he's saying is totally verifiable. You can go back and see for yourself, and you can verify that everything that the Jews are saying is wrong. And he rejects the accusation that he was a troublemaker or stirring up riots. He said that simply was not the case. I was not in the temple making any scenes. I wasn't there with anybody. Paul was by himself. He certainly wasn't there with Trophimus. Trophimus. 
And so he, he rejects that altogether. Well, verse 14, Paul's going to make his second defense here that he's not a ringleader. He's not a ringleader of the sect. So verse 14, But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. This being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense toward God and men. So Paul's going to, at this point, begin to, to dive into the truth. He's going to start getting very gospel-oriented here. And so up to this point, you know, this message has been, you know, pretty just kind of giving you information. But I, I want, as we talk about these things, to set our hearts and our minds upon the Lord and appreciate the glory of what Paul is talking about here when he addresses God and and uh, Christ and the way as he refers to it. Um, and so he confesses that he indeed is a follower of the way. He admits that. And that's a great title for the, the Christian, the way. We don't use that really anymore, but that was one of the earliest designations for the Christian church. And it speaks to the fact that Jesus is the way. Jesus is the way. You know, when he, he talked to to Philip, I believe it was, you know, Philip said, Lord, Jesus said, you know, where I'm going, you know. And he says, we don't know where you're going, and we don't know how to get where you're going. And he said, Philip, I am the way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And that's so beautiful, because it's not, there's not a direction that we have to take. It's not a geographical location. It's in a person. We just set our hearts on Christ. We put our trust in Him. We live our lives for the glory of His name, and He will lead the way. He will come back for us as His own. He said, I go to prepare a place for you, and where I am, you will be. And the way you know, He is the way. So we follow Christ as the way. And as such, He shows us the way that we are to live our lives, the way that is pleasing to God. And uh, that's such a, such a beautiful reality that we have the way to heaven made plain for us, but the way to live our lives, the way to please God. There was many years of my life where I didn't understand. I didn't know the way, and my life was super chaotic. And sometimes you see people that are still very much in that place. They are so lost. They are so confused. They are so burdened. They are so broken, and they cannot see it at all. They are oblivious to, to the mess that they are in. But Christ came to give a better way. Christ came to show the way to God and the way to live a whole life, a sanctified life, a godly life, a productive life. Amen? That is the way. And Paul said, I am a part of that. I, am, I do follow the way. And he rejects this. He says, this is not a sect. This is not some offshoot that is in rebellion and, and going off. I'm not some ringleader. I'm not some cult leader. That word sect there, it's kind of interesting. It's uh, the word heresy uh, in, in Greek, the word from which we get heresy. And so it's a, it's a very negative thing. And Paul is rejecting that flat out. But he affirms that his beliefs, that Christianity is rooted in the law and the prophets. He says that. Um, he says in verse 14 that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. You understand that, that our faith was born out of the Old Testament. That's why we believe that the Old Testament is so important. Some people would say that it's, it's irrelevant. We don't need it anymore. But there's so much that we understand about our walk with Jesus. There's so much that we understand because of the Old Testament. And Paul said, look, I didn't come to abolish. That's what Jesus said. He said, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill the law. And that's what Paul is saying here. This is not some offshoot. This is not some sect. This is not anything like that. This is actually a fulfillment of what was spoken in the Old. The Old Testament is a shadow of the substance that was to come. You know, you, you look at the sacrificial 
system in Leviticus, Exodus, Leviticus, and you begin to understand uh, this idea of, of sin, it has a consequence, and it's, it's a very serious matter to God, and it requires death to pay the penalty of sin. And so when Christ comes on the scene and John the Baptist says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the earth, we begin, the sins of the world, we begin to understand, we make that connection. This in the Old Testament was a picture of the ultimate fulfillment that was to come in Christ Jesus, the Son of the living God, the Lamb who would come to take away the sins of the world. And so Paul affirms that everything that he, uh, he holds to, everything that he teaches and believes, it is a fulfillment of the Old Testament altogether. So he has not spoken against the prophets and the law. And in fact, Jesus said that if you love God with all of your heart, soul, and mind, and strength, and you love your neighbor as yourself, all of the, the law and the prophets hang on that. And so the law is, is beautiful. God's law is wonderful. The problem is, is that we can't keep God's law because we are not. We are sinners by nature, and we are, we are uh, fallen, and so... Uh, that would be bad news if we thought that we had to keep God's law. But God's law is beautiful nonetheless. But Christ came to keep God's law on our behalf. That's the good news. And so we don't have to do that. We have to believe that. We put our trust in what Christ has done and that He came and He honored God's law. He fulfilled God's law perfectly in our place. And so Paul says the law is good. The law is holy. The law is great. And I would not... I would not speak against it. All right. Um, Paul, he mentions here that he worships God through the way. And that is totally consistent with the New Testament because you have to go through the Son to get to the Father. Is that not what Jesus said? I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And so Paul said, I worship God through the way. Through the way. And First John says that he who has the Son has life. He who knows the Son knows the Father. If you don't have the Son, if you don't know the Son, you don't have the Father. And so once again, Paul is pointing out here that he is worshiping the God of their fathers through the way, through the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he affirms the resurrection. He says, if I'm on trial here because of the resurrection, that is all throughout. And the, the Pharisees in particular, held to the resurrection of the dead, the resurrection of the just and the unjust. And so Paul believed in the resurrection. Christ is the resurrection and the life. Amen? And so he did not deny that. He didn't reject that. And he couldn't be on trial for that because it was commonly accepted amongst the Jews that it was a reality. And it was a reality that Paul preached and that Paul loved and that Paul looked to and lived for. And it is a reality that we all need to be so very aware of. There is a resurrection of the just and the unjust. We are eternal beings. We are created in the image of God with an everlasting soul. And if you don't know Christ, if you don't know the Father, that soul will live on for all of eternity in a place called hell that God has created for Satan and his demons. It's a place of torment and punishment. It's a place that none of us want to be, a place that none of us would want to go. But that is the resurrection of the wicked. That is where they will go. But then there's the, the resurrection of the just. And that is for those who have put their trust in Christ and our sins have been paid for on the cross. Our sins are washed away. They are removed. As far as the east is from the west, they are gone. And so there is no condemnation. There is no judgment. There is no punishment for the Christian the judgment is what we refer to as the Bema seat. That is the place where we'll actually be judged based on the good things that we did. We'll be rewarded for the things that we did for the Lord while we were, are here. You know? And the things that we did for ourselves, the things that we did because we wanted man's appreciation, man's accolades, that will burn up like fire in the, in the, the judgment of the, the just. But we will not. We will enter into glory forever and ever and ever with our Lord. And so Paul affirms, hey, I believe in the resurrection of the just. 
and the unjust. And, you know, I just don't want to pass it up without saying that that is the grace and that is the mercy of our God, that there was such a terrible place, but He didn't desire that anyone would perish, but that we would have eternal life. God doesn't delight in the death of the wicked. He would that we would turn to Him, that we would have life. And God made a way through His Son so that we wouldn't have to enter into the judgment of the wicked. And Paul says, having, having knowledge of this, I strive to walk uprightly before God and men, not to be an offense. Paul's life in many ways was shaped by the reality of the resurrection. Paul knew that because this is coming, because this is a reality, my life ought to look a certain way. There ought to be a certain urgency to live for the Lord. And to not be found ashamed or shocked or anything when the Lord returns, but that we can celebrate the day of His return because we were faithfully serving Him, obediently worshiping Him. And so that was Paul's confidence. Now third, his defense here against desecrating the temple. Verse 17. Now after many years I came to bring alms and offerings to my nation in the midst of which some Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple, neither with a mob nor with a tumult. They ought to have been here before you to object if they had anything against me, or else let those who are here themselves say if they found any wrongdoing in me. While I stood before the council, unless it is for this one statement which I cried out, standing among them concerning the resurrection of the dead, I am being judged by you this day." So Paul is pointing out the fact that he was in Jerusalem in the first place to be a blessing. He didn't come there to stir up a riot. He didn't come to desecrate the temple. He came to give money to the Jewish Christians and alms. Remember that? He had been taking up uh, love gifts from the churches as he was going on his missionary journey so that he could come to Jerusalem and give to the people that were so desperately needy there at that time. And so he says, I came to be a blessing, not to, not to desecrate. In fact, he had entered into that, that ritual, that rite of purification. Remember, he was told by James to pay for these guys to get their heads shaved and to, to take an oath with them and then to go to the temple for purification. So he was actually observing Jewish uh, rites and rituals there in the temple. He was not desecrating the temple. And there was no Gentile with him as they had falsely claimed. And then Paul says, look, and those were the people that started this whole thing, okay? It was the, the Jews from Asia that were there in the temple. If they have a charge, they ought to be here today. So that's basically shutting the door on this whole, this whole case. Because the Romans took the law very seriously, and that was a big deal. If someone was going to lay a charge against you, they had to be present. In fact, charges could be put on them if they didn't show up, and they weren't even there. So Paul says the very people that started this whole thing, the very people that made this accusation in the first place, they aren't even here. And so that's kind of case closed as far as Paul is concerned. And then he does reference that one point where he cried out that he was on trial for the resurrection and then the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees turned on each other. It was kind of his way to kind of get out of a hot situation really fast. So he does kind of fess up to that. Well, now Felix enters into the story. So the Jews came with tortillas and laid their case against Paul. And then Paul defended himself on all three points. And now Felix is going to speak to this. But when Felix heard these things, having more accurate knowledge of the way, he adjourned the proceedings and said, When Lysias the commander comes down, I will make a decision on your case. So he commanded the centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty and told him not to forbid any of his friends to provide for or visit him. So Felix uh, was very familiar with the way. Being stationed there in Caesarea, there was a lot of Christian activity happening there. You'll remember, I think it was Acts 10, where Cornelius uh, was a, uh, an Italian um, leader of a, a cohort there. And so he uh, called upon... Um, Peter, Peter came and, and preached the gospel to Cornelius' household there in Caesarea. So there had been a real presence of Christians there. And so Felix knows about these things. He's pretty familiar with it all. And he basically says, look, I tell you what, um, I want to hear from Lysias. I want to hear from the commander about this. 
And so he basically closes the case temporarily there. He ends the hearing on, at that moment. Now, he had already received a detailed letter from Lysias when Paul was, was brought to him. So he probably didn't need any more information. It's hard to know what more information he could have possibly needed. In all likelihood, he's just trying to get out of this situation because really he, he should have turned Paul loose at this point. There was nothing to hold him on, but he didn't want to create an outrage with the Jews here. So he just said, look, I'll, I'll figure this out later. So he, he puts it off. And so we're going to come back to that because we're going to see that's kind of a, a normal thing for Felix. He does this. And so um, Paul was kept under guard and he was allowed certain privileges. Now I will say he's going to be uh, under their guard for a couple of years. But this is actually a, a sweet setup for Paul. Uh, the last few years of his life had been just really hellish with all the beatings and shipwrecks and everything that he had gone through. Now he's, he's in a really a, kind of a beautiful place. He is under guard, so he's protected, and he's allowed to have privileges, visitors that can bring uh, love gifts to him, so on and so forth. So that's kind of Paul's situation. So verse 24, And after some days, when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Now, as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come, Felix was afraid and answered, Go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. So Paul has the opportunity of a lifetime here to, to share the gospel with Felix and his wife Drusilla. As he is incarcerated here in Caesarea, they come to him and they're interested. They want to hear more about this, more about Paul's faith in Christ. Drusilla is here now. She's an interesting character, too. Um, she was the youngest daughter of Herod Agrippa I. She's probably about 19 years old at this point. So actually, her great-grandfather would have been Herod the Great, the one that put all the, the children to death uh, in, I think it was Matthew chapter 2. And so that, that's her lineage. And as I said, she's about 19 at this point, And she was Felix's third wife. Uh, she had been seduced to leave her husband. She had been uh, married to a Syrian prince by her brother. Her brother set that whole thing up, and she didn't like the guy. This is my understanding as I've kind of looked into this. And uh, Felix was so st uh, taken by her beauty. She was known, uh, some of the historians said she was one of the most beautiful women in all the land. And Felix was so taken by her beauty that he sent a friend who was posing as a... Uh, a sorcerer is what, what one, one person said, and basically came in and made all these wild promises and stuff to her if she would leave her husband and, and come marry Felix. And so she did, long story short. And uh, so they were in a really terrible situation in the first place. And now here's Paul talking to them about righteousness, about faith, about self-control, about judgment. And I think what that must have been like. For Paul to stand in that place and to begin to talk about righteousness, to talk about the righteousness of God, that there is the almighty creator of, of heaven and earth, and he is the perfect standard of righteousness, and he dwells in unapproachable light, and he is perfectly pure and perfectly holy, and we are not, and Felix is not, and Drusilla is not, but there is one who came to be righteous on our behalf, Jesus, Jesus Christ the righteous. And so undoubtedly, Paul is making these connections. God is righteous, you are not. But God has sent His Son to be your righteousness. And then he goes on to talk about self-control. And again, you know, for Felix to have gone from being a slave to the position that he had in Rome... He went crazy, and he was known to be a man of great immorality and brutality, and he used his power, and he was a, a corrupt guy. And then he uh, lured this young lady away from her marriage to be his third wife, and now Paul is sitting here talking about righteousness and self-control. And you, I'm sure, could understand this is just hitting them right between the eyes. And again, I have no doubt that he is pointing to Christ here that you've had a life of absolute disarray. 
chaos given to your, your passions, your, your lust, your impulses. And God brings self-control through His Son, Jesus Christ. In fact, Christ is the perfect picture of self-control because His very life was that of service to others. Christ was not about Himself. Christ was about another. Christ came to do the will of His Father who sent Him. His food was to do the will of God. And His life was spent serving other people. He said that the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give His life as a ransom for others. He modeled self-control in that He was totally selfless. Christ was not in this for Himself. And then lastly, Paul talks about the coming judgment. In light of all of this, in light of the righteousness of God, in light of of your life of rebelliousness and sin and wickedness that they have given themselves to, there is a coming judgment of which I had already spoken. And so what was Felix's response to this? I mean, he was scared. He was trembling. He was alarmed, some, some translations say, and rightfully so. It would appear that he was coming under the conviction of God as the gospel was being preached, as he was being confronted with his sin and he had a choice to make. He was trembling. And what was his response? Uh, I'll get back to you on that. He said, okay, uh, I can't deal with this right now, but you go away, and when I have a convenient time, I'll call for you. But you know what? That convenient time didn't come. That convenient time never came for him. As far as we know, he didn't put his trust in Christ. He did not receive the things that Paul had to share with him. And then within two years, he's going to be banished. He's going to be sent back to Rome, and then he disappears into obscurity. And his wife, Drusilla, when that happens, leaves, takes her son, goes to Pompeii, and she is there. Uh, she dies in a volcano eruption. And so uh, her life is, is gone at that point. And that is our life. It's like a vapor. And you never know. You never know. I'm sure she thought that she was good. I'm sure she didn't wake up that day and think, you know, I'm going to die in a volcano blast today. I mean, that's pretty random, you know. And so God had been so gracious to them, you know, because I don't doubt that Jesus loved Felix and Drusilla. And he would have them to choose life. And they rejected it. They put it off. They said, maybe some other time, some other time when it's convenient, I'll call on you. And that time never came. Let that be a lesson to us. We don't ever want to do that. Today is the day. If you don't know the Lord, today is the day. Don't be so sure that tomorrow is the day. Today is the day. If there's something going on in your life right now and you know God is calling you to, to put that away, God is calling you to cut that out, today is the day. Today is the day. Don't put that off. Respond. Respond. You know what God is calling you to do. So verse 26, Meanwhile, he also hoped that money would be given to him by Paul, that he might release him. Therefore, he sent for him more often and conversed with him. But after two years, Portius Festus succeeded Felix, and Felix, wanting to do the Jews a favor, left Paul bound. So all the while, Felix is meeting with Paul. What he's really wanting is money. He's really hoping that Paul's going to pay him off. Now, this was illegal, but still very commonplace. But again, it just tells us something about Philip, Felix and his corrupt heart. As I said, Paul is incarcerated for two years here, but Felix is succeeded by uh, Festus because of the Jews. They hated Felix so much, and they made such a complaint to Nero that Nero took, took him out, took Felix out, which says a lot because Nero... Nero was one of the worst humans in all of Western history. I mean, he was a bad, bad guy. And uh, for him to want to take Felix out uh, because of his treatment of the Jews, it just really goes to tell you what an inept guy he must have been as a governor. And so Felix, in his attempt to try to soften the blow with the Jews, because he's going to have to go to Rome and, and give an account for his, his leadership, and uh, it would appear that he's trying to win favor with the Jews, which it does not. It doesn't work. But before he goes, he, he kind of tries to work out this deal and, and says, uh, you know, I'll leave Paul in here for you. And so he does. And Paul remains a prisoner of the Lord. Paul is still bound. And Paul is going to continue to honor God and glorify Jesus and preach the gospel. 
And that, that was his life. And I guess I just want to kind of come back to that as we're getting ready to transition into our, our time of communion and celebrate the Lord's Supper. I just I see that so clearly. Paul had a hard go of it, but he saw himself as a prisoner to the Lord, and he sought to honor God in every situation. I mean, do we do that? When things are going rough, when we're struggling, when we're having a hard time, are we worshiping the Lord with the same with the same zeal that we worship Him in the good times? You know, when, when things are going really bad, are we trusting that God is doing a, an awesome work and that He's working it together for good and for His glory and for His purposes? Do we see ourselves as prisoners of the Lord? We're not prisoners of our circumstances. We're not prisoners of our, of our choices. We're not prisoners of, of politics. Or, or, or anything like that. We are servants. We are prisoners, as it were, of the Lord. We, we are uh, bound to Him, and uh, we are to honor and do His will and all of that. And that was Paul. He did that. And it's easy to say that and for that to go right over our heads, but if we were to really stop and think about that, where we're at in our lives, I tell you that that comes up a lot more than you might realize if you really stop and consider that. So with this, uh, I want to kind of transition over and, and just really focus on Christ. This has been a good message to, to preach the gospel and to honor Christ as Lord and Savior. And so there's no better way to, to bring the service to, to an end than at the Lord's table. Amen? So why don't you turn with me over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. Paul speaking to the Corinthians, he says, "For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. We'll stop right there. So Paul is looking back to the night when Christ was getting ready to uh, be betrayed. And the following morning he would be taken to the cross where he would be crucified. But here he's with his disciples in this upper room the night before his crucifixion. And he takes this bread and he breaks it and he said, Take this and eat this. This is my body which was broken for you. And then he takes the cup and he passes it around. He says, drink of this, for this is my blood. This is the blood of the new covenant, which was shed for you. And Paul says that we're to do this. We're to do it in remembrance of the Lord. And as often as we do this, we proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Now, that's very significant, guys. I love that verse. Jesus has given us this physical reminder, this representation of what happened for us. This is the gospel. And it's something that has been given to the church so that we could regularly come before him and remember, remember that Christ came and he died for us. His body was broken and his blood was shed. He suffered under the wrath of Almighty God on our behalf. Our sins were placed upon him on that cross and his body was crushed and his blood poured out in payment for our sins. I mean, imagine that. Think of that, all the atrocities, all of the horrific sins that have happened in this world and will happen, and that Christ bore the weight of that upon Himself. He was crushed for us. 
And so every time that we, we partake of the, the cup and the, the bread, we remember that. That Christ did that on our behalf. He suffered so that we would not have to. He being rich became poor so that we could become rich. He took our place. And we reset every time at the table. And we're told to examine ourselves. First off, are you really in the faith? If you are not a Christian, if you haven't put your trust in Christ, then this is not for you. And I say that as graciously as I possibly can, but this is for the church. And so this is for the believer. If you have received the, the work of Christ on your behalf, then this is for us to celebrate. Amen? But here's the thing. Christ wants you to be His. And so if you don't know Him, if you haven't put your trust in Him, today is the day. Don't be like Felix and Drusilla. Don't put it off. You can celebrate with us this very day. You can put your faith and your trust in what Christ has done on your behalf. You can believe on the name of the Son of God. And you can be saved. And this can be a day of great celebration. And then you can look forward to the judgment to come for the righteous. The resurrection for the righteous. And so we're told to examine ourselves. Where are we at, Christians? How are we doing before the Lord? Is there something that needs that we need to confess? Is there something that we need to repent of? Is there something that we need to put away? This is the time to do it. I mean, we can do it at any time, anywhere, in any place, but this is especially a time where we get right before the Lord, where we confess our sins, and we step into that, that refreshing place with God, and we remember what Christ has done on our behalf, because it's all about Him anyways. We all know we're sinners, right? We all know that we have blown it. And so we're able to come back to the table and say, thank you, Lord, that it's not my works, but it's the works of another. It's because of his broken body, his blood, his perfect life that he lived on my behalf, his resurrection. And that's what we celebrate. That's what we remember when we come to the Lord's table. And when it says here not to take it in an unworthy manner, that means have respect for what's happening right now. Don't be flippant about it. Recognize the, the holiness, the, the sacred nature of what we are entering into right now. And really set your mind and your heart upon the Lord and what He has done. And get right before God. And, uh, and, and treat it very seriously. And he says that some people have even fallen asleep because of their, uh, their disregard for the Lord's table. It's serious. It's special. It's sacred and it's holy. And Christ has given this to His church. And so we're going to have the worship team come up. They're going to play a song. I'm going to invite you guys to go ahead and come on up as the music starts to play. And you can get your elements. So you can just come up the middle and get your stuff and go back down uh, into your seats. And we'll all take together at the end of the song. But just remember what you're doing as we come forward. And I want to encourage you to, to set your mind and your hearts on the Lord and thank Him. This is a time of celebration. It's holy, it's serious, but it's beautiful, and it's something that we should have great joy in. Amen? Amen. Father, we love you, and we're so grateful for the cross. We're so grateful for what it represents. And today, God, afresh and anew, we say thank you for sending your Son to die for us. And we say thank you, Jesus, that you were willing to leave, leave glory in heaven above and to come to this earth and take, take the form of a, of a slave even and to die the most horrible death imaginable on our, on our place, in our stead. We thank you for that, Lord. And we believe that you rose again from the grave, victorious over sin, over death, and we celebrate today as believers, as believers in Jesus. And we worship you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.